Welcome to Your City Connections, where you get to meet entertaining and informative guests. Guests such as an artist with a brush, or with a camera, and guests with a violin. City Connections, providing insightful interviews with favorite son, Lieutenant Governor Todd Lamb. To City Commissioners, the Mayor. Interviews with a Rodeo Queen, to Beauty Queen, and even a NBA player. Now, join Steve Keim as he discusses another engaging topic on City Connections. Hello again, and welcome to City Connections. I'm Steve Keim and have the privilege of providing a very uh, special guest each week. And you know, our, our common theme is to find someone that has that connection to Enid. And our special guest definitely has a connection to Enid. It's Lieutenant Betsy Randolph of the Oklahoma Highway Patrol. And for those of you that will look at her and say, I remember that little girl, if I could say that. <laughs> she graduated from Bethel Baptist Academy. And we, we won't discuss the years, but we know that you went there and graduated. But she, she is a Bethel um, Baptist Academy student. She worked in broadcasting in Oklahoma and Texas and New Mexico and even Missouri, I believe. Mm -hmm. And if you look at her bio, she has an associate degree from uh, Northern Oklahoma College in journalism, uh, an associate degree in horticulture from Oklahoma State, um, from the folks to the east of us. She earned her bachelor's degree from Southern Nazarene University. And in her spare time, she's working on her master's. I don't know if it, it's completed yet, but it she's is. working on that. Yeah. Well, congratulations. So Thank she you. has a master's right. that she received from Oklahoma City University and also served uh, for 12 years in the U.S. Army Reserves. And when you see her, she's going to look awfully familiar because if you watch uh, any Oklahoma television, you're going to see this person. You go, man, she's awful familiar. Well, she has served as a spokesperson for the Oklahoma Highway Patrol. And currently, she's, again, as lieutenant with the OHP, assigned to Troop R, which my understanding, that is associated with the state capital area. Th that's correct. So welcome to the Enid Television Network studio. Thank you. Thanks Lieutenant for having me. Lieutenant Betsy Randolph. Do I call you Lieutenant through all this or, or can I, I get away with say ma'am or, or I really Betsy? wish you'd just call me Betsy, please. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you. We got the rule straight. Yes. Well, welcome to Enid. And um, tell us about your con uh, connection to Enid. I, I know besides the Bethel Baptist Academy, uh, mom and dad are close by, correct? They are. Yeah, my folks live here. Uh, we moved to Enid in 1981. We actually lived here before that. I, I think the year was 1976. We lived here. My dad was the associate pastor of Cleveland Road Baptist Church. And then we moved back to New Mexico, where, okay. where I'm originally from, where right. I was born. And then we came back in 81, and my folks have been here ever since. They have the church and the school, and, and for some time had a radio station as well. Very good. Well, it's always exciting for me to um, meet individuals that's had a connection to Enid and then bring them back for a little reunion and right. so forth. Oftentimes, Betsy, when, when I have a special guest, I'll ask them about growing up in Enid, what kind of impact did it have on them personally or professionally? So I've got to ask you the same thing. Here you go to kind of a private school, sure. uh, Christian-oriented school, if you will. But that experience and living in Enid, what kind of impact did that have on you? Well, you know, I was a child of the 70s, uh, and when, when I lived here in Enid, way back then, way back then, <laughs> way back then it was a different yeah. world then. Yeah. You know, we ran all over yeah. town. Um, I have an older brother, Brian, and a younger brother, Brent, and we rode our bicycles, and we rode all over town. We Left would, them out in the yard. Absolutely, <laughs> yeah. And so we would leave in the morning, come home at, you know, at, at dinner time, and we would hang out at the bird sanctuary, hang out at Meadow Lake Park. Uh, there wasn't any part of town we didn't, you know, just cruise around. So I think that I had a great childhood. Uh, I did grow up there in, you know, in a Christian home and went to a Christian school, but I had friends at all the different schools. And we just, it was a wonderful childhood in Enid and never worried about uh, being out after dark or bad guys getting us or anything like that. So. Well, I have to go back a decade earlier to for me to relate, but it's the same thing growing up in Perry, Oklahoma. You just got on your bike and rode all across town. Absolutely. All the neighbors knew who you were. Right. If you got in trouble, they knew about it. If you Absolutely. did something good, they knew about it. <laughs> but it was something that I wouldn't trade right. uh, because it was just great relationships and really an impact on me. Well, as I went through your extensive bio, you have a lot of formal education, military career. So tell us how in the world or just, I guess, fill in the blanks, if you will, on your professional career, from broadcasting to military police. Can you fill in the blank right. there somehow? How that happened? <laughs> yeah. Well, first I'll tell you, 
when I was when I was a child growing up in the 70s, the the TV shows really had a, an impact on our lives. And what TV shows we did see after school were, you know, Adam 12, mm -hmm. Emergency, uh, Police Woman, Starsky and Hutch, those kind of shows. Yeah, not Dragnet, huh? Oh, maybe, maybe <laughs> I don't know. I was really, really influenced by Adam 12. In fact, I had a little lunchbox that I carried to school in first grade that was Adam 12. You know, the little metal ones, the ones that mm -hmm. are antiques now. Right. Um, and so I always wanted to be in law enforcement. You know, when my dad started the, the Christian radio station and I began in, in radio here in Enid, worked for a couple of different radio stations here in Enid, I, I knew that I wanted to do broadcasting, but there really wasn't any money in it. And I always had this desire to be in law enforcement. And so I, for a time, I, I started in, in law enforcement at Artesia Police Department in Artesia, New Mexico, my hometown. And I had lived with my grandmother for a while, was just helping her. And my folks wanted me to come back to Oklahoma. And their deal was, we will help you pay for college if you'll come back to Oklahoma. Well, the truth was, you know, Baptist preacher, they really couldn't help me pay for school. Sure. And so I decided. But it sounded good anyway. <laughs> it really sounded good. And I bought into it. I came home. Uh, but after I had left home, graduated high school in 1988, I was 17. There really wasn't any living back with mom and dad. Not that I was a bad kid. You know, you see the halo and everything, but I just, there was no living back with them. So yeah. I lived on my own. And so I joined the Army Reserves as a way to pay for my college. And because I always wanted to do law enforcement, uh, and they were offering, they had the military police school as, a, as an offering, and I jumped on board with it, loved it. And so, and that was the easy transition for me when I came back from basic and AIT, started school there in Tonkawa, and got on with the Tonkawa Police Department. And so it just, you know, I, I, do, I do believe that God has a plan for, and has a plan for everything that I did in my life, even though I thought that I was making my own plans, he was kind of steering me one direction, and here I am. Well, let's take this professional step a little bit further. Now let's talk about the OHP, Oklahoma Highway sure. Patrol. Uh, from from Tonkawa Police Department, and military police, uh, your path ended up with the OHP. Tell us about your career at the OHP. Well, I was one of 12 people that got hired right after the Murrah bombing. Uh, there was a state hiring freeze, and I had I was on maternity leave from Tonkawa Police Department. When I came to the academy in Oklahoma City, the police academy, it was housed there at the um, Department of Public Safety. And so my, I would see my, my not he wasn't then, but I saw my future husband, you know, in and around the training center. And so I fell in love, got married, and so when I was on maternity leave for Tonkawa, I actually started applying at these different agencies in Oklahoma City in hopes to move to the city. And so the Capitol Patrol was one of the places that I hired, that I, that I applied for. Mm -hmm. uh, the Capitol, um, at that time, the Department of Public Safety had, deep, had uh, OHP, the Lake Patrol, and Capitol, Capitol Patrol were all different divisions under the umbrella of DPS. And so there was a state hiring freeze, like I said, going on. But that after the after the bombing, the governor, Governor Frank Keating, lifted that that hiring freeze and hired 12 emergency hires, and I was one of those. Uh, got started with the Capitol Patrol in July of '95, and then you know, you may not remember, but the legislator rolled the the legislators rolled the Capitol and the Lake Patrol into the Highway Patrol in '98 and 2001. And then I came to work for the Highway Patrol just because of that transition. I was essentially grandfathered in uh, into the Highway Patrol. In 2004, I went through a transition academy and then left the, the Capitol Patrol. I was a sergeant by that time. Uh, left them and came to, the, came to the road and worked Oklahoma City metro area and then Logan County and then public affairs and kind of back and forth, several of them, until I got uh, up, uh, promoted with the the patrol in 2013. Well, we're going to talk a little bit later in the program about your role as spokesperson because I know people are familiar because as they see this interview, they can say, I recognize her. Either she was standing out there in the blizzard or something right. telling people, stay home, do not get on right. the road or anything like that. But we'll talk about that in just a moment. So, uh, well, thank you for being here. Well, welcome home, I thank should you. say, and we're sure glad that you're here. My special guest today on City Connections, Lieutenant Betsy Randolph, former uh, Enid resident, uh, Bethel B Baptist Academy graduate, and uh, came back to Enid today to visit with us about her role with the Oklahoma Highway Patrol. We'll have more with uh, Lieutenant Randolph right after this.
Welcome back to City Connections. Thank you for staying with us today. My very special guest, former Enid resident, Lieutenant Betsy Randolph with the Oklahoma Highway Patrol. Betsy, again, I've alluded to during our interview that people will recognize you because I've seen you num numerous times on Oklahoma City Television. Um, in your past role as spokesperson, tell us what that role was all about. We know, we know you're always talking about weather and things of this nature, but also there was accidents and things that you needed to report on shootings and things of this nature. What kind of role is a spokesperson for the OHP? You know, it was an exciting, okay. exciting job. I loved, I loved public affairs. It seemed like it was the perfect combination for somebody like me who had the journalism background, mm -hmm. who had the uh, experience working in radio. So I kind of knew what the journalist wanted when they were calling me, asking me for stories. And I knew the message that we, as the patrol or as the agency, wanted to get out. And it was, you know, partnering those two up when, whenever we would do any interviews. Um, but I, I love doing that job. Uh, I love what I'm doing now, but I really did enjoy that job, mainly because I could sell my, whatever my safety message was, each and every time I got in front of a camera or, or any time I did an sure. interview. Sure. And I noticed, uh, Betsy, on your bio that you were the recipient for the uh, Matthew Scott Evans Award for Traffic Safety. It's um, provided to other individuals as well, but you were a recipient. Tell us about that award. I was very humbled to receive that award. You know, I, I didn't know Trooper Matt Evans personally, but I know his mom, and she's a very dear, sweet friend of mine. Worked for a number of years at the Highway Safety Office. And so I was very honored to get that award. I was nominated simply because I worked in the Public Affairs Office and did so much work for promoting traffic safety. We also had our Facebook pages for the Highway Patrol and DPS, and so I was managing those at the time, doing that, and plus all of our interviews that had to do with just traffic safety and motoring safety and, you know, asking people to slow down and not text and drive and not drink and drive. Uh, so those were the reasons that I was nominated and received that award. With you just mentioning the text and, and, and drive, um, how are we doing as a state? We could do much, much could, better. Okay. Yeah, we could do much better. I, I know that people are aware of the problem. I think that a lot of people, and myself included sometimes, are so easily distracted and we think we need to, the phone goes off, we think we need to at least look at it. And even that little bit of a distraction is enough to cause a person to, to get in a crash or cause a crash and it's just not worth it. And I think here just on a recent trip that I was on, I was, my wife's in the seat, and I said, they've got to be on their phone. I'm behind them, and they were just kind of doing this <laughs> yeah. slowly and then going back this way. Yeah. And so, and we actually got up to that intersection. They were on their phone, and, and my wife kind of said, well, you were right. Only this time, one time, Steve, you were only right. <laughs> but it's, sometimes it is obvious that, yeah. that they are not driving. They aren't. They're, not, they're behind the wheel, but absolutely. they're not driving. And what we don't understand, a lot of people don't understand, is that your eye can only focus on one thing at a time. We learn this in firearms. We look at the front sight when we're shooting. Uh, your eye can only focus on one thing. So if it's focused on this screen that's in front of you, less than a foot away, and then you've got all these other things happening in front of you, whether it's debris in the roadway, whether it's a child that's run out mm. that you can't see, uh, even those kind of things, and it only takes, uh, there's n not even a time limit that we can put on it, a second, not even that, before your life can drastically change while your eyeball is glued to this, and the time that it takes your eye to refocus on something in the roadway, and then if you have any type of medication or intoxicants in your system that's going to delay your response, sure. that even adds to it. Um, well, I think the stats that they came out and said, NHTSA came out with something that said, in the time that it looks for you to read a text, four seconds, at highway speed, 70 miles an hour, you've traveled a football field length. Without looking at the without road. Without looking at the road. Are you okay with that? Because I'm not. No. No. No, because football field's a long way. Right. So we, <laughs> could do a, we could do a lot better. Well, let's shift gears a little bit and sure. talk uh, something that may be not so glamorous about your role because it sounds like you've definitely had a distinguished career and, and you've been involved in some uh, high-profile roles within the OHP. But I know that you've encountered some bad guys sure. during your career. Absolutely. Um, how dangerous is your job? Do you know the job of a law enforcement officer nowadays, not even just the highway patrol, but specifically the patrol in that we're, we work a, a lot of times by ourselves in remote areas mm -hmm. all over the state. Right. So it is a, dan a dangerous job, um, but the roles of law enforcement nowadays is so much more dangerous because our society has changed. 
And I think any law enforcement officer out there that's working the road today can tell you that even uh, five years ago, uh, society was different. The people we encounter on the roads are different. Uh, their attitude towards law enforcement is different. The, the amount of respect uh, that we used to have, we no longer have, just from the general everyday public. And so that makes it a dangerous job. I have encountered some bad guys in my line of work, and I don't know if it's because I'm a female or if it's because I wear lipstick or if it's because I look like I'm nice to people. They like to fight with me, and I'm not really sure what that's about. I don't like to fight. I don't like to touch people. I don't want them touching me. Uh, and that's really an unusual um, position because people in law enforcement, you think that the perception is that we want to get out there and wrestle with people. We don't. I want to go home at the end of my shift. And when I retire, I don't want to be hobbling around on sticks or, you know, all gimped up. Right. But unfortunately, that's what happens is we, we encounter people that don't want to comply. And we have no choice but to, especially if they have warrants, to bring them to a magistrate. We have to take them to see the judge. If they're driving, you know, under suspension, we have to take them to jail. If they have warrants, felony warrants especially, we've got to get them into custody and take them to jail. And so uh, we do see these people like the Michael Vance, you know, the shooting that the troopers were in just recently. There are bad guys out there who don't want to go to jail, who tell you they're not going to jail, you're not taken to jail, and you know, your options are limited. As a law enforcement officer, you've got to get down in the weeds and, and get dirty with people yeah. sometimes. And sometimes we read the outcome of that shootout, if you will, in the newspaper, and we almost think that's um, almost like reading a, a novel or something like that. But no, that's real life stuff. Yeah. This happened on an Oklahoma highway. Yeah. The, um, this person did take lives of other individuals and it just it came out to a shootout. You, you said something interesting just a few moments ago about, you know, earlier in our lives we had this respect towards law enforcement. Oh, yeah. And I remember as a kid growing up, uh, officer asked you to do something, you just did it. There was no why or anything Absolutely. else. And you touched on the fact that that, that expectation has changed mm -hmm. now. And I guess it's obvious for you in law enforcement, you have noticed that the maybe lack of respect or lack of adhering to a command or something like that has changed. Does that is that bothersome for everybody on the patrol? Sure. I mean, how, how do they, uh, how do you uh, handle that, I guess, knowing that culturally times have changed? Well, it's, it's a defeating feeling. Uh, it's something that it's almost oppressive. You just feel depressed. You're like, I just don't know if I can do it mm -hmm. again today, go out there and face people who don't want to listen. And when, when, when at, at the end of the day, all you're trying to get people to do is to just do the right thing. Uh, you're not asking them to comply to something that you've made up. This is something that uh, a law that's been passed that they need to comply with. And most of the time, the laws that we're trying to enforce are ones to keep people safe. You know, sometimes our job is to protect people from themselves. And it's irritating when you can't get people to buy into the idea that you're just doing your job uh, not because you're trying to oppress them, not because you're trying to keep them from having a good time, but because you're trying to keep them safe. And so it is kind of aggravating, it's frustrating, but those of us in law enforcement know, we try to remember why we signed up to do this. It was to, to help sure, people. And sure. so that's why we keep putting our uniform on and, and slicking our hair back and putting <laughs> our hat on and getting out there and yeah, doing the job. Very good. Well, I certainly appreciate uh, you putting the hat on and doing the job. We won't go into the detail, but I know in my preparation in my research of the interview with Lieutenant Randolph that uh, she has been injured on the job just simply doing her job simply to arrest people that's not going to cooperate and she has suffered some consequences of, of fights if you will we won't go into that but I just mentioned that to our viewers just to say that I personally appreciate your willingness to do that to keep us all safe I know it's it's not glamorous but you have um, you have sacrificed uh, yourself physically, um, you know, to keep other people safe. So thank you for doing that. I have a question, and we take this about the role of, of women in OHP a step further. Uh, how has that role changed for, for just women alone in OHP? And can you tell us about the numbers? You were part of that immediate 12 that Frank Keating put into place, but how about the numbers today of women serving in the OHP? 
Well, I'm glad that you asked because I went to the trouble to get a hold of HR today and get those exact numbers. <laughs> so I found out today we have yeah. rights. We have 794 troopers working. That includes all the command staff, commissioner okay. and uh, assistant commissioner included. 794. 794. And of that 794, 17 of those are women. In the 80 years that the Highway Patrol has been uh, around, we have had four women pr promoted to lieutenant. I was the fourth one promoted. And we've never had a woman promoted higher than the rank of lieutenant. So we could do a better job. There is a place for women in law enforcement. There is a place for women on the Oklahoma Highway Patrol. Yes, it is a dangerous job, but it's a kind of job, and any kind of job that you're gonna do is dangerous. The world is a crazy place, we know that. It doesn't matter if you work at a donut shop or a bank shop or 7-Eleven, you, you, church, school, movie theater, it doesn't matter. The, the truth of the matter is, is that there are bad guys out there, but it takes good people, you know, it takes a good person mm -hmm. with, a good, with a gun, an op one that's operable, to stop those bad guys, period. Because they're out there in every facet of life, uh, in every place that you're gonna be, they're gonna be. And so we do, need, we do need people, men, women, to come and work on the patrol. You know, we've got a shortage of people. We've never had, I don't think we've ever had this low of a number, 794, at least to my memory, uh, on the patrol. We've got 77 counties that we've, we're stretched thin is basically what I'm saying. And so we need folks to come work for us. We're gonna have an academy next year. Uh, we're, we're, I think the applicants are open right now. Um, so we, we ask people, if you've got a servant's heart, because that's what we need. We, do, you, do you know that age, um, the parameters on the age for? I, I believe the ages are 21 to 45. I, th I think that's right, 21 to 45. Okay, very good. Well, our special guest on City Connections, Lieutenant Betsy Randolph. As I mentioned in the opening, you know, she has an associate degree in broadcasting and then an associate's degree from Oklahoma State in horticulture. So I found out that she's a master gardener. That sounds serious to me. <laughs> and also when she has some spare time, whenever that is, uh, she has the opportunity to write a few books. And we want to talk about gardening and her book writing efforts. And we'll do that right after this. Thanks for staying with us on City Connections. Welcome back to our final segment on City Connections today with our very special guest, Lieutenant Betsy Randolph. And again, as we said in the opening, um, Betsy, very familiar with Enid because she uh, went to Bethel Baptist Academy and uh, both of her parents are here in Enid. And we appreciate uh, Betsy coming back uh, from Oklahoma City yes, to be here at Enid Television Network Studios today. Well, we've talked about your military career a little bit, your academic career, your role uh, in, as in the OHP, if you will. Um, Gardening yes, sir. is a big deal to you, yes, sir. and also you take time to do some writing. Tell us, horticulture, associate degree in horticulture from OSU. So tell us about your master gardener work, I guess. Okay, well, <laughs> I'm a member of the master gardeners there in Logan County. Okay. Uh, I've served as president for a while, vice president for a while of the club. Does this mean you have a big garden? I do, <laughs> I have gardens, gardens. Gardens, yes. okay. I have a secret garden, which okay. is a little tiny garden, and then I've got gardens just everywhere. Okay. We, we, our, our property is like a, maybe almost three acres, and I've got, I don't know, okay. 700 some odd things that my husband has to mow wow. around. Yeah, wow. yeah, I love it. Love, love digging in the dirt or soil, whichever, but I, I really, I don't do f fruits, vegetables, anything like that. Well, I do, but it, I, I really don't enjoy that much. What I enjoy is just flowers okay. and trees. All right. And you've written the children's books, uh, some adult mystery books and so forth. Right. Uh, again, with an associate degree in journalism from NOC, mm -hmm. undoubtedly writing is a big part of your life. So love tell to us, write. is that therapy for you or? It sounds like you have a full slate. I, I do. Of this uh, lifestyle. Yes, yes. Well, as a matter of fact, what happened was I, I had fought with somebody uh, on duty back in 2008 and, had, and got my wrist tore up and my elbow. And so while I was off work, I was in a cast from my fingertips to my armpit, nine different casts that year, 2009. And so I was off work a lot. Well, while I was off, I was going crazy. With so I needed something to do. And so I started taking some online advanced writing classes okay. that I could just, you know, do like that and so I had so many built up that I I wrote a book and that was the first book it's called tokens of the liars and I was part of a uh, so I 
part of a writers group called uh, Red Dirt Writers Society there in Guthrie, and it just kind of it just kind of happened. I had all this work from these online courses. I put a book together, and then my mentoring that happened there with my writing group. Uh, I just started writing, and that first book. It, now it's four. I've got two other books that I've haven't published yet, but uh, I love to write when I'm not digging in the dirt or riding a motorcycle or working for the patrol. I I, I write. We're, Bessie, we're at the close of our interview, and I feel like we could, we've covered a lot. It seems like we've yes. covered a lot of, of, of ground in our visit, but it almost sounds like we could also talk a lot more about a variety of topics, especially OHP. But I want to give you this opportunity. I'm kind of putting you on the spot here, but I want you to talk to the folks here in Enid, and um, if there's something that you just felt like, you know, if I ever had an opportunity to go back to Enid and, and talk to everyone, this is what I say. Is there anything that comes to mind that you'd like to, uh, I'm, I've kind of put you on the spot. You and are I, putting me on I, the spot, I apologize for that. And if there's not, you say, nope, Steve, not a thing. <laughs> and then we'll just move right on. Well, I just will say that I really enjoyed my childhood growing up in Enid. And I always come back. Uh, home, you know, my folks live sure. here, and my I have my little brother lives here and his family, and so I I come back to Enid as often as I can. I love the hometown feel of Enid. Uh, my best friend growing up still lives here. I've got lots of friends that live here in Enid still, so I don't know that there's anything necessarily I would say except that um, we just appreciate. I appreciate the consistency that is Enid. I love Vance, uh, Vance Air Force Base sure. and uh, the support and appreciation that the town has always had for the military, uh, which is uh, you know very near and dear to my heart. My son is active duty Army stationed out at Fort Bragg. And so I love hometowns that welcome uh, law enforcement and welcome uh, the military. So I think Enid's doing a great job at that. Well, as we were talking earlier, uh, I guess you can't put anything past Lieutenant Randolph because she is very observant. She goes, what about this coin that's over here? Well, okay, uh, you, you caught me. Seriously, uh, Betsy, we, on behalf of the city of Enid and the Enid Television Network crew, we want to say thank you for making the trip up from Oklahoma City to be with us today. And for all of our dignitaries and special guests, we have this comm commemorative wow. um, in a coin, if you will, and you see Thank on, you. on the back side, and that way you have it at your desk there in Oklahoma City, and you'll just be mindful of the day that you came to the ETN studio to, to share your story. I love that. And uh, we hope you'll come back, and we, we, sh we share this, or uh, that opportunity with so many people that we interview, uh, with Frank Keating, who's been here, and Governor yeah. Walters, and everyone, so we have an invitation for them to come back. We want to extend that to you as well. I appreciate so, that. So, Lieutenant Bessie Randolph, thank, you, my friend. thank you for your service. Thank you for keeping us safe here in Oklahoma. And uh, I'm glad you got to come back and see Mom and Dad today. Me too. Thanks for letting me be, uh, le let me claim Enid as my second hometown. And uh, I do love Enid. And thank you for allowing me to be here yeah, today. It's our, it's our pleasure. Thank you. And thank you for joining us today on City Connection. Lieutenant Betsy Randolph, um, Look her up, see what all she's involved in. Maybe she'll send you some cucumbers or, or something like that. <laughs> I don't know, but flowers, that's right, some flowers. But we appreciate her coming by today here at ETN. And thank you for joining us on City Connections. Until next time, I'm Steve Kime. Make it a great day.